evening. Honor and a privilege for me to be able to speak to you, and I'm glad that we can be here. Wanda and I don't get to be here too frequently because of our being at Grassy Lead, but um, we do like to be at both places. Can't be at both. So it's nice that we're able to uh, switch them back and forth. Two weeks ago, when Brother Victor Eskew was presenting his lesson on honesty, he introduced that with a story that I will relate to some who might not have been here for that presentation. And just as a reminder for others, and let that lead us into what we want to talk about this evening. He told about a little girl who lived in Iowa, had gone to the county fair, and had a dollar to spend, and she lost it. She was very distraught. She hunted everywhere for the dollar, couldn't find it. The people around were concerned because she was so concerned, and they tried to help her find it. And there was a kindly old gentleman standing over here, and he thought, well, I'll solve this problem. So he took a dollar out of his billfold, folded it neatly, and put it in his shirt pocket. And then he came up and said, young lady, I heard you lost a dollar. Yes, sir. And I wish I could find it. He said, I believe I have your dollar. And he took that out of his pocket and handed it to her. She looked at it a moment and handed it back to him. And she could have taken it and said, thank you, sir. Wiped her tears and gone and gotten her a snow cone. But instead, she handed it back to him and said, no, sir, I don't fool my dollars that way. So that was not hers. She recognized it was not hers, and her honesty called her not to accept it when very, it would have been very easy for her to have done so. That reminded me of an incident that occurred in Shreveport a number of years ago. There was... A young girl there, her name was Alice Faye O'Daniel. Her mother, Faye O'Daniel, was a piano teacher. And um, uh, our daughter took piano from her. Alice Faye and Wanda Joe, not too far apart in age, I guess. But when Alice Faye was quite small, she came home one day, maybe from school, and told her mother that I saw a $5 bill on the sidewalk just lying there, nobody around. And Faye asked, well, did you pick it up? No, Mother, it wasn't mine. So she left it. Both of those stories uh, show the innocency and the honesty of people. And Brother Eskew presented a wonderful lesson on honesty on the part of Christians. He concluded that with a thought on which I hope to build. And that is that we need to be honest with ourselves. He presented the need for honesty. Going back even to the Old Testament where God always has demanded honesty. In Leviticus 19, one of the statements in that chapter is that you shall not defraud, you shall not cheat, you shall not lie. In the 15th Psalm, there the question is asked, the psalmist said, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? And the answer was, he that walketh uprightly, he that liveth righteously, and speaketh truth in his heart. Only these two Old Testament references, out of many, that show that from the very beginning, God has demanded honesty on the part of his people. For our consideration this evening, not only then do we want to remember some of the things that Brother Eskew told us about how we must be honest with our neighbors, how to be honest in business. We have to be honest with members of the church. He mentioned that there were problems that occurred in the church even where honesty did not exist evidently totally among the members of the church in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 6. So we must be honest with each other. We must be honest with the world. We must be honest with the Christians round about us. But we also must be honest with ourselves. And there, I think, is a question that is important for us to consider. I'm not um, uh, at all attempting to preach Brother Eskew's sermon because he did an excellent job with it. But I want to pick up where he left off and build what I think will be a continuation of a good thought for us 
And that is being honest with ourselves. He did mention First Corinthians, uh, Second Corinthians, uh, thirteen verse five, in which Paul wrote the church at Corinth and said, "Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Knowing you not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobate." And in that he said that when we were told to examine ourselves and to prove ourselves, these two terms were used as they would appear in a court of law. When a witness would come into the court of law, uh, either a plaintiff or a defendant or a witness as to what might have happened. When one goes into a court of law, the attorneys and the court examine that person. And before they start their examination, it's necessary for those persons participating in that examination to state and determine uh, they will present everything exactly as it is, everything according to truth. And um, so those people must answer truthfully the questions that are going to be asked. In our consideration this evening, in the instruction Paul gave the church at Corinth, we want to answer each of these questions truthfully as they pertain to ourselves individually. Uh, I'm not answering questions for Jake, and Jake will not be answering questions for me. But these questions that we ask, we must answer individually. And that's true for every one of us. And I think that these are some questions that are worthy of our consideration. One, the statement in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, where Paul told the Christians in Corinth to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We know what steadfastness is. We know what unmovable is. We know what always abounding in the work of the Lord is. My question is, as we answer that for ourselves, are you, as a member of the church in Randolph County, always abounding in the work of the Lord? Now, answer that question honestly with yourself. If I were a farmer and I abounded in wheat, I'd have a lot of it. Or if I abounded in beans, I'd have a lot of it. And if I'm a Christian and I'm going to abound in work, I must have a lot of it. And ask yourself the question, are you, as an individual Christian in Randolph County, abounding in the work of the Lord? Or are you just kind of coasting through? It's an important question because it's a question that we're going to face. The scriptures teach that we must do that. Jesus said that we must love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. He said that if we love our mother, our father, our brothers, our sisters, our wives, our children, more than we love him, we cannot be his disciple. He said that we're to seek first his kingdom, then all these other things will fall into place. So if we're not abounding in work, we're not meeting that particular condition that Paul placed upon the church at Corinth. In Romans 12, verse 11, Paul said that Christians are not to be slothful in business, but to be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Fervency is putting some zeal, some energy, some effort into the things that we're doing. Not just going about them in a lackluster fashion, but putting some power into it. And Paul said here that this fervency in spirit is in serving the Lord. When Paul said to examine yourself whether you be in the faith, to prove your own self, am I fervent in my service to God? Am I fervent in my service to the Lord? Or do I let things come and go in the easy fashion? In Romans, the sixth chapter, <clears throat> there's a thought that I want us to consider in verse 13 of our being alive in Christ and see the manner in which Paul used that in addressing the church at Corinth. He says, Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Paul said to the Christians at Rome, and he would say to the Christians in northeast Arkansas, uh, Are you alive unto God? Being alive unto God means to be vibrant, vivacious, full of activity. That's the way he said to the church at Rome they ought to be. 
That's the way you and I ought to be. And as I examine myself and prove myself, I need to ask myself, am I really alive unto God or am I just comatose? There's a difference and there's, there's a possibility that one of those two situations can exist. Heart's still beating. Blood's still flowing in a comatose person. But that person really is not alive and active. We need to determine how we are individually as it would pertain to being in the Lord. Paul wrote, Timothy, be thou an example unto believers. And he named a number of Christian characteristics. Faith, knowledge, love, charity. These characteristics we're to have and we are to exhort others in being examples for others. But then a question that uh, I believe is worthy of our consideration. Maybe more so than some of the others at this particular time is um, that which we've been studying on Wednesday evening concerning Christian stewardship. I don't know, you probably have already filed your taxes. If so, you're ahead of me. I hope to do it by April 15. I think I will. But as you consider at this time of year, you do have to consider what you've done with what you have. And um, as you make that consideration... This is a good time to make a comparison as you're filling out that 1040 as to what has come into the coffers in this year and what has gone out in the various ways that it goes, including uh, what has gone for charity or for church purposes. This is a good time to compare the relationship between those two figures. And I think it's important for our consideration for the simple reason in studying Christian stewardship, we've studied not only the fact that all that we have belongs to the Lord, all that we are belongs to the Lord. Even we ourselves belong to the Lord. Our talents belong to the Lord. Our time belongs to the Lord. Our activities belong to the Lord. And I am just as responsible to God for how I use my time how I use my talents, how I dispense my love, any Christian characteristic that I have, I'm just as much responsible to God as to how I do that as to how I do my money. It all belongs to God. And it all needs to be devoted in service to God in a proper relationship to what the total is. Um, in, the, in that study, we have seen many different examples that I think are extremely important. And um, as we consider time, talent, activity, all of that belongs to the Lord, and we owe God a given portion of that time, a proper portion of that time. We can ask ourselves, as Paul told the church at Corinth, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, prove your own self, as I examine myself and prove my own self as to how I have used my time. Each of us has, what, 162 hours in a week, I believe it is. Um, I, I don't have a calculator here, and my calculator appears not working exactly. But I believe every one of us has that same number of hours every week. How many of those hours do you devote to the Lord? How much time, what relationship of that time do you devote to the Lord? It must be a good portion of that time if God is going to be pleased with it. Just as he requires that for our labors, our talents, and anything else. Jesus said in <clears throat> Luke the sixth chapter, verse thirty eight, Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men heap unto your bosom. For with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. What Jesus has said here that if we're liberal with God, he would be liberal with us. And the implication is that if we are not liberal with God, he will not be liberal with us. Give and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For with that same measure that you meet, or with the same uh, figure that you use in giving to the Lord, in that relationship the Lord's going to give back to you. And uh, so it's important for us to consider 
uh, that aspect of life. In Malachi chapter 3, the question is asked beginning in verse 8, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. God speaking to the Jews. He is asking, will a man rob me? He's saying, yes, you have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? The answer, in tithes and offerings. We've seen in our study the relationship that the Jews had in giving. We've seen in the biblical history that even the poorest of Jews gave at least a tenth of their income to God. Some gave up to 33 to 35 percent. But even the poorest gave at least a tenth. In addition to that, they gave free will offerings and other offerings. And uh, so here God has asked, will a man rob God? And the answer is that you have robbed me as an offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Now this place is, in, in my thinking, the way God looks at us, as it would relate to our giving to him that which we have. He said, here, these people robbed him. They did not give the proper tithe. They did not give the proper offering. And uh, he said, you're cursed with a curse. Why? Because you robbed me. You did not give me that which was due. In verse 10, he said, bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out you a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. <coughs> and that's what Jesus said in Luke 6, verse 38. You give liberally, and it will return to you again. Um, here, God says, you bring what you need to be bringing to me. And see if I won't bless you abundantly. That's the message that Jesus gave in Luke 6, 38. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure. Pressed down. Shaken together. Um, some of you grew up on a farm as did I. And you have maybe had a bushel basket long years ago of ear corn still in the shuck that you've been measuring. And you put that in that basket and you pressed it down and you shook it because it will sink down in there a little more. That's the way Jesus described it. And then piled high to be sure that the basket is full to overflowing. That's the way Jesus said we're to give to him. And he then has promised that he will be liberal in giving to us. The concluding part of our lesson, then we go back to Paul's statement in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves. In each of these questions, it is important that we apply them to ourselves. When I stand in judgment, no matter what any of you did, I'm going to be the one to stand and fall on my record. That same thing is true of you. Your wife cannot help a husband at that point. Daughter cannot help a mother at that point. No one can help you at that point. God's going to be looking at you and you alone, how you've lived, how you've treated God. That's going to be the determining factor concerning the blessing or otherwise that will be bestowed upon you in judgment. So Paul said, examine yourselves. Prove your own selves. You're not proving somebody else, but you're to prove your own self. And he said, in that examination, do you not know that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobate? But you need to take a look at yourself to see whether God will look at you as being a good one of his people in his kingdom. Or, as um, Jesus, for instance, looked in Matthew 23, the scribes and Pharisees. Now, they were Jews, but they were... Uh, I think by and large, we would call them maybe scoundrel Jews because they had, um, they had even fought the Jews themselves. Um, the scribes and Pharisees had. But he said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. But the children of Israel, 
did not get to enter into the Canaan land, the land of Canaan, many of them, because they did not obey God. The Hebrew writer tells us, Hebrews 4 and 5, 4 particularly, that they could not enter because of unbelief. Their belief brought about the fact that they did not obey. And they fell because of what they had done. I don't want to fall when the judgment day comes. I want to be invited into heaven. And whatever it is that it takes from my part, I want to meet it. And I want you to examine yourself and see that if there is a lack in your zeal for God, a lack in your service of time for God, a lack in your use of talent for God, a lack in your use of your love for God, and anything that you can do that God wants you to do, fill up that void so that when the time comes, you will be blessed. If you've not done that, we urge you tonight to make a determination to change. And if there is a need for making a public statement relative to that, we encourage you to do it. If you've not been baptized into Christ, then you haven't even started the journey. And now's the time that you ought to do that. So as we sing the song of invitation, if there's any lack on your part as you examine yourself and prove yourself, Take the steps now to fill that void. Let's stand and sing.